Hello and welcome to this introduction video on Groundhog. In this video, we'll cover why Groundhog was developed, what it is, and how you can use it for your calculations. We will go over the basic structure of Groundhog functions at the end of this video. Groundhog is a general purpose Python package which provides robust and transparent implementations of lots of geotechnical functionality. The implementations are parametric, so any calibration coefficients can be changed by the user. The functions are also fully documented and the documentation is freely accessible online. So that documentation allows you to check what you're doing and whether your inputs that you're providing are in the appropriate units. The implementation is also open source, so if you wish to check the implementation, and verify its correctness, you can do so simply by browsing through the source code online. The package is released under Creative Commons license, which means that you can uh, use the material for studying purposes. You have to attribute the package if you choose to adapt it, and any adaptations have to be shared under the same license terms. This package is used in the geotechnical courses that I teach at the University of Ghent and in my, researcher, in my research as an offshore wind researcher at the University of Brussels. Both universities have joined forces and are active in wind industry research through the OELAP initiative. If we want to know why Groundhog was developed, then you have to look at the typical engineering workflow for geotechnical analyses. We will get data, site data, construction data, and structure that data to allow us to do a calculation. Then we will determine which equations, which methodologies are suitable for our problem. We can go to standards, uh, methods, that, methods that have been published in journal papers or conference papers, but we need to make a decision how we're going to tackle our problem. Once we've made that decision, we're going to implement the functions that we need and execute them to obtain results. These results have to be critically reviewed because ultimately we're going to take a decision based on those results, either make the foundation smaller or larger, perform more site investigation, a number of different outcomes are possible depending on your problem. This workflow is absolutely fine and I think that any practicing geotechnical engineer or engineering student will agree that this is a solid way to go. The problem is, however, that we generally lose a lot of time during the implementation phase. In the implementation phase, we will go from a methodology to an actual computer-based implementation of functions and everybody will have performed such implementations. And the thing is that if everybody re-performs that implementation, there is an error margin there. So Groundhog really aims to alleviate the pains of that implementation phase and give you the necessary tools to get going with geotechnical analysis without all the hassle of having to reprogram everything yourself. Groundhog also wants to provide reliable implementations. So every time that you execute a function, you can be sure that its outputs are fit for purpose and also that the parameters are within the expected ranges. Lots of geotechnical functions have been developed based on underlying datasets and if you go beyond the ranges of the parameters in that underlying dataset, the correlation might no longer be valid. And that's something which I see with students a lot. They use correlations which might not always be fit for purpose. So that's where the documentation comes in. It tells you exactly what parameters the function is expecting, what their ranges are and what units they have. The package is also unit tested and that means that for every function a hand calculation has been performed and the result of that hand calculation has been included in the package as a check. Every time that Groundhog is re-released, so every time a new version comes out, I will rerun that unit testing suite to ensure that all of the checks are satisfied. And if we do find a bug, which is always possible because this is still software development, then we will write a new unit test 
to ensure that that bug does not happen again in the future. Why did I decide to go for Python? Well, I think Python is a very versatile and very easy to learn programming language, which is suited for a range of tasks. From web development to object-oriented programming, you can do a lot of things with Python. And that also is shown in the traction that it gains among researchers and practitioners. I think nowadays already a lot of people are using Python in their workflows. A lot of you will also have come into contact with Python by using it as an interface to high-profile softwares such as numerical analysis softwares or uh, geographical information systems. And also, Python is currently being taught in undergraduate courses, so a lot of students already have a working knowledge of Python, which is nice to build upon. And let's face it, in the end, nobody really likes Excel. Excel was never developed as an engineering tool, and after having used it myself for several years, I hold pretty strong opinions, especially now that I've seen how easy and elegant Python can be. Workflows implemented in Excel are hard to follow, and also we don't have the possibilities that Python offers in terms of vector-based operations, etc. Now that you know all this, you're probably wondering, how can I start using Groundhog? Well, the first thing to do is to go online to the URLs shown in this slide and just run one of the interactive notebooks. Those notebooks already demonstrate which functionality you can use in Groundhog. And there are notebooks that show you basic use of functions, which is what this presentation is largely based upon, some CPT processing, AGS file reading, dimensioning of shallow foundations, etc. But if you want to use Groundhog on your own system, you're going to need a Python installation. And I recommend using the Anaconda installers because they come packed with a lot of pre-existing packages and functionality. Groundhog is not included in Anaconda by default, so you'll have to install it using pip. And you can simply type in the command pip install Groundhog in a command prompt or a terminal window. And once you have that, you can open your Anaconda Navigator, fire up the Jupyter Notebook server and, getting, and get started with either pre-existing Jupyter Notebooks or create notebooks yourself. The basic structure of Groundhog is best explained through an example function. And here we will use the relative density calculation according to Jamalkovsky et al. from the paper in 2003 as a vehicle to demonstrate how Groundhog works. This correlation was based on a number of calibration chamber tests and those tests were contained within specific stress conditions. So the vertical effective stress, for instance, did not go lower than 50 kPa or higher than 400 kPa. So Groundhog will actually validate the vertical effective stress that you give to it, which needs to be in kPa, and it will check whether it is within that range. And if it isn't, the function will simply return a NAN value, not a number. That will prevent the that will not interrupt your workflow, but it will also prevent the function from being used outside its validation range. But what if I want to extrapolate, you're probably wondering? Well, if you want to extrapolate, there is a way around it, which I will show you in just a minute. The function is fully documented, so you can see which input parameters it accepts with their units and their ranges. Then you can also see the functions that are being implemented, the equations, and you will also see that the calibration coefficients in these equations are parametric. So if you want to change any of the calibration coefficients, you can do so. You can change their predefined values. The function outputs a dictionary, and a dictionary is a data structure in Python which contains multiple outputs. And that's nice for geotechnical calculations where we're often interested either in intermediate steps or in multiple outputs resulting from one calculation. And here we will get the relative density for saturated and unsaturated soils in a single function call. That relative density is not specified in percent, but is unitless. And that is also indicated in the documentation. If we want to use this function, 
we can import it from Groundhog by typing in this import statement. So the function is part of the PCPT correlations module in the in-situ tests sub package. So we'll import it by typing in that statement and executing it. And then we have the function available, so we can call it. And if we call it with a QC of 20 megapascal, a vertical effective stress of 100 kPa, and a coefficient of lateral earth pressure at rest of 0.8, we're going to get the dictionary with the output. And to access a single value from that dictionary, we can simply include the key within square brackets, and then we simply get the relative density for saturated conditions, which is 83% in this case. Python makes it very easy to automate things. So here in this code example, you can see that we're generating an array of vertical effective stresses, selecting 20 values between 10 and 500 kPa, and then running the calculation through a map lambda statement. This will map all of the vertical effective stresses in the vertical effective stress array to the function and return the saturated relative density. So each element of the input array, the vertical effective stress, will be filled in to the equation and we will get the corresponding relative density. So the result is an array and you can immediately see what happens if you go outside the validation ranges. So the first two values and the first and the last four values were for vertical effective stresses outside the validation range. And the calculation has returned nan there, not a number. And this will ensure that you can still safely plot the output of this function without generating errors. If we want to customize the validation ranges, we can always append a double underscore min or double underscore max argument to our function call. This happens in this code example, where we were going to relax the validation range to 10 to 500 kPa. So you will see in this function call that we have two additional arguments, sigma v not f double underscore min and sigma v not f double underscore max, which have the customized validation ranges. So now you have overridden the validation range, but anybody who checks this function can immediately see that you've gone beyond the boundaries which are normally implemented for this function. So this also makes workflows developed with Groundhog easier to check. There are several other possibilities with Groundhog, which are not covered in this video, but you can have a look at the tutorial notebook on basic use of Groundhog functions to see what other options are available. You can return another value, uh, in case you exceed the validation ranges. Sometimes it's easy to return zero if you exceed validation ranges rather than none. You can also choose to raise an error anyhow, but you're going to need to specify that because Groundhog functions fail silently, as we say, by default. Or you can disable validation altogether, but I wouldn't recommend doing that. The tutorial basic use of Groundhog functions shows you what I've just um, demonstrated in this video, plus the additional features possible. So that's it for this first video on Groundhog. I hope you've enjoyed it. If you have a comment, you can always leave it in the comments to this video, or email us at groundhog at snakesonbrain.com. Consult the GitHub page to raise is issues or start collaborating on code. Check the documentation or run the interactive calculation notebooks using Binder. Thank you for your time and see you for the next video.